Hello, everyone. Hello. Attention, attention. We will begin stopwatch six. Everyone's attention, please. Thank you. Welcome to Stockwatch 6. My name is Aisha Heiko and the manager of archival services at the College of Charleston's Avery Research Center at History and Culture. And I'm also one of the Charleston directors, so I'm glad to be moderating this session today. We have a series of presentations that we will be going through. Each presenter will be coming up one after each other. They have six minutes to present, and then we'll type a Q&A at the end of each of all the presentations have completed. So without further ado, I welcome to the stage um, Amy Castillo. All right, thank you. Um, and thank you for joining us I know in the afternoon. Um, it's a good conference so far. So I'm Amy Castillo. I'm the um, Director of Access and Discovery at the University of Te uh, uh, Texas at Arlington Libraries. Um, and um, the perp, I, my uh, abstract is slightly, um, I don't know, I guess not different, but like I had to kind of uh, shorten it a little bit in terms of kind of uh, my purpose of my case study. So I took it as an opportunity to look at our uh, DDA EBA purchases made over the past seven years. Since we have primarily moved to a uh, patron driven acquisitions model, that doesn't mean that DDA is our only version of of our acquisitions model is just a piece of it. Um, but I also had curiosity on uh, whether our diverse campus community translated to diverse purchases made from our DDA ebook candidates. And I simultaneously wanted to trial the resources for college libraries tool based on a collection uh, assessment webinar from earlier this year. Um, this case study uh, focused on DDA ebook titles that we have purchased, or I should say our community has purchased, um, through the ProQuest ebook central program that we have with Gobi between 2016 to 2022. And the total number of uh, titles that were purchased were um, 2,532 titles. So a bit about University of the Texas at Arlington um, in terms of our diversity and rankings. Uh, we have over 41,000 students uh, for headcount, and we're, um, according to US News and World Report, the fifth most diverse university. Um, and I've also listed out um, different uh, diversity aspects, um, including our um, uh, Hispanic serving institution, Asian American, Native American, Pacific Islander serving institution, and um, very recently our Seal of Excellencia certification. Um, and just updated like literally two days ago the um, becoming number two best or considered best for veterans according to military, um, excuse me, military times. So, um, so that there. And then I included just um, to cover briefly uh, the DEI definitions that I use for this framework um, that I had pulled from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development DEI de definitions. And I pulled these because they seem most aligned with um, what I was looking for uh, for this case study. Uh, for the actual assessment, um, I utilized this trial for um, uh, resources and college libraries to help identify the major subjects of these purchase titles from 2016 to 2022 again. Um, and from that total of the over 2,500, only 366 titles were found in RCL. And I will add a caveat that um, I wasn't expecting 100% um, inclusion of the titles within RCL because it's intended for listing of core essential titles and is continuously curated um, as years roll forward. So like there were um, years like 2016 that had less coverage, I guess, in RCL compared to more current years. Um, and so while only 14% of those that total was found in RCL, I did find that the tool is um, valuable um, for major subject information that was uh, kind of delivered in very helpful categorization. Um, it didn't seem too broad or too narrow. Um, and then for this DEI assessment, I wanted to look at identities, race, ethnicity, ability, and social justice as our categories um, to highlight for the purpose of this. Um, although this is particularly time for interdisciplinary titles, um, and I didn't go the extra step to look at authors as well, which I feel like I need to add in the future. So part of the process um, was downloading the GOBI reports for DDA activity, and I've listed out the steps there. Um, and then I searched all the titles in RCL during that trial period, which was 30 days. Um, I did not have success with the uh, ISBN import feature, which I was hoping would be like super quick. Um, so I ended up having to search each title, each title manually. Um, so it, it did take some time there. Um, and then again, um, uh, found 366 
um, of that 2,500. And then the second um, step of this process was using uh, the summarize with pivot table feature to review the subjects purchased by years and totals. Um, and then from that, um, I highlighted um, uh, subjects that I felt fit into the DEIA kind of framework or the parameters. Um, but what I also found was interesting was seeing the, time, the uh, areas of focus change over, over time. So um, I will probably um, full, put, add the full list of uh, uh, subjects into the proceedings, but this is just a small snapshot of the most frequently, uh, frequently purchased subjects from the RCL review. Um, so I've just hided a, a few there. And then this is um, the top 10 subjects from that. Um, distributed by year. I apologize because I know that this is hard to see. Um, so that's something else that I'll try to clarify in the uh, proceedings too. Um, but I will add, um, there were some years, or again, kind of that progression of time, it wasn't very noticeable um, that uh, a lot of our titles from 2016, like the early years, were more science and um, like prep te uh, books and workbooks and things like that. Um, in the early years, and then it really moved toward humanities and social sciences um, in the more current years. And then these are the bottom 10 subjects um, listed as well, and I'm going to use this information to help with uh, adjusting our profile as well. So um, for continued research, I'm just kind of really considering this as a preliminary review because that larger set of over 2,500 titles I think, you know, I want to analyze the full set rather than just that 14% uh, that I did with RCL. Um, and then I want to use another tool for subject analysis and benchmarking. And then the work itself has been valuable to just actively look at what uh, has been purchased um, to get an idea of where the gaps are adjusting our program file profile. But it has been interesting to see um, kind of that um, uh, usage for a uh, for um, titles in the BIA framework. So thank you for your time. slide actually shows up. I hope you can see it. Has the clock started yet? I did, but I can no. go back. Can, can you? Oh, okay. that'd be fantastic. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Michael Lindsay, and um, thank you for the opportunity to talk with you today on analyzing point of care tools. Just to, um, I, I thought that I would approach this almost like as a poster session, but uh, as, we, as we approach our 2021 renewal, of our primary point of care tool up to date, uh, we realized that this was going to be different from renewals that we had had in the past. So um, early on, uh, our uh, dean, our, I'm sorry, our, sc our school leadership had appointed a working group to um, analyze the, uh, the tool and uh, to provide recommendations. <clears throat> and uh, as, as you can see, um, there's a kind of a few charts here of a uh, user survey that we put together. So before the working group even had its first meeting, uh, we were taking a look at uh, you know doing an in-depth um, data analysis of the, the usage of the tool, as well as uh, you know the, the user survey. So the user survey included several questions, but uh, these these two were the ones that I kind of wanted to show you uh, first. Um, as you can see, as hopefully you can see. Uh, that big orange bar there is um, that's how important is the tool for your uh, professional education and uh, so uh, nearly 50% said it was critical. Uh, there was one faculty member that was even saying that uh, if the tool, the enterprise subscription was no longer available that it would uh, damage uh, resident recruitment. So um, and uh, the uh, second chart there is uh, you know how frequently do you use the, the product um, and, uh, the largest cohort said that they used it more than once daily. So I just, I just can't even imagine, you know, a database like that. But you know, this uh, it is up to date, and it's it, it, for those that might not be in medicine or familiar with it. 
uh, up to date as a point of care tool. It's essentially like an ebook, but uh, it's more expensive than any ebook you've ever seen. It's um, at least uh, we're paying around a quarter million right now, and it will go up to uh, about a half million within five years. So, uh, so that's the why this is you know kind of so kind of stress inducing. But uh, our uh, kickoff meeting, we shared the survey results. And one of the interesting things about that is that within about two weeks of the study's release, of the survey's release, uh, we had over 50% uh, uh, response rate, which was really unusual for us, unusually high and fast, and uh, which also made it particularly interesting when we started putting together a second survey, a follow-up, to uh, for them to for our uh, residents and uh, and faculty to rate a resource. So for this um, for the second uh, survey that we put together and released as well under you know the dean's letterhead, we received one response. So um, our folks were really you know there was a lot of anxiety that was going around the campus about the possibility of us cutting uh, this one particular database. So. Um, and this anxiety, you know, was really, uh, you know, it, it was what was surprising about it is it wasn't just uh, residents, faculty, physicians. It was also nurses. There were a lot of nurse practitioners that were heavy users of this particular product. It's almost like crack. It's an addiction to to these to, to our folks. Um, so as we were kind of approaching our deadline. And we were starting to get, you know, really concerned and nervous about that. The working group, which had been, you know, composed of residents, um, faculty, uh, some other physicians, and uh, led by the library, uh, we uh, met and made our recommendation, which was to um, renew the product, but with enhanced analytics. So, um, I, I, gosh, I didn't even touch that. But the analytics part of it was that. Uh, most of our usage for this particular product was uh, was anonymous, um, and um, <clears throat> we did have like a tiny subset of registered users where we're able to pull out uh, that are around 50% of the clinical folks were using it versus the uh, the academic. So uh, so that was um, that was a really important uh, finding that, that we were able to use later, as you know, as you can can see hopefully. There's that little red spot in there toward the end. That was when the contract actually expired. So we were actually working on a renewal, uh, and the um, and the, the negotiations were at the top level of the uh, of the institution between our, our dean. I'm sorry, with, between school leadership. He doesn't want us named, him, but anyway, but uh, I, I won't give his name out or anything. But uh, between our dean and uh, by the leadership of uh, of, uh, of the product. So um, after, uh, um, after the uh, expiration, a day later, they were able to come to an agreement and we renewed it. And, um, the, uh, and cost sharing was agreed to between uh, the school and, uh, and the, the hospital. So that really kind of saved us for now. <laughs> but, it's, but it's an ongoing problem. So what we learned was that um, some of the, the best feedback that we received when uh, doctors looked at these questions themselves and uh, devised their own questions and compared uh, different products, you know, the, you know, but using their own questions that were relevant to, in their specialty, and uh, and also that uh, uh, that cost sharing is very important. So, um, thank you. How's everybody doing? Pretty good? It's Thursday. It's the end of the day. Thanks for coming. Really appreciate it. My name is James Rhodes. I'm the Assistant Director of Continuing and Electronic Resources. And uh, I'm at Virginia Tech. I've been there a little over a year. And uh, since I got there, I kind of found out some things. And I really found out how important succession planning is. Now, not everybody that thinks about succession planning looks at it as a favorable thing because if you talk to somebody that works for you or reports to you and you tell them, hey, let's start working on a succession plan. They start thinking 
that maybe you're looking to replace them. But that's not always the case because I really think um, what a, a good succession plan does is it's like the old saying, you know, failure to plan is planning to fail. Um, so you really, uh, it, it has a deep place uh, in any organization that has workflows. Uh, and all these pictures are from uh, Blacksburg, if you've never been there. Uh, this is my library. Well, you know, if you don't have some planning in place, it could be a, a cold, dark night. <laughs> um, but you know, this happens to everybody, right? You have people that leave that find other jobs. You have people that retire. Uh, you have people that might get sick, and you even have people that die. And I've experienced in my short time at Virginia Tech uh, all of these, and there weren't plans in place. So, you know, that can be pretty scary. So, um, you know, if you don't have a plan in place, you're kind of looking through some obstructions because you know what kind of needs to be done, but you're not quite sure of the whole process itself. So I really think that's why there's such a great importance to take the time to do this. Um, you know, it, the way it used to be, and I know there, there might, if there's any catalogers in here, they, or what do you, you go with a different title now, right? Metadata something, something. But, um, you know, with books, it was a lot more simple. You know, you bought the book, you catalog the book, you put the book on the shelf. Uh, and that's not the case with digital communication or digital resources. Uh, you have so many people involved now uh, from across campus. You know, it's not just between the library and the vendor, but it's the library, everybody on campus and uh, the vendor because there's just so many pieces to the, uh, the process. So from my point of view, view uh, it's the collections and technical services. I have four units that report to me, acquisitions, electronic resources, interlibrary loan, and collection processing. I, and I just want to speak to a couple of these. Um, so in regards to acquisitions, um, so when, when I went for the interview for the position, I found out the unit head for acquisitions was going to go to finance. So, you know, I, it was a little like, what should I do now? I get, I'm getting this information. Uh, and then they actually said, well, the director of the, the very large department, oh, she's retiring at the end of this month. So I, I was thinking, you know, this could be a little bit of trouble. Um, and in regards to the electronic resources, since you're dealing with so many people, and especially vendors, if you have multiple, you know, resources, um, they have the email addresses of the old people, the people that were there prior. So it's really easy for invoices maybe not to make it to you. So what, what I identified right away was uh, making sure that we pay the bills. And if there's any vendors in here, I hope you appreciate what I'm saying. We want to make sure we pay you. Um, but if we don't get the email with the invoice, we can't do it. Uh, so that did happen. So immediately we did a project where we reached out to all the vendors, to our contacts. But a lot of times, you know, the vendors organizations are, are just as layered as uh, in a university or a college. So uh, you don't always get uh, through to the people that you want to, but uh, we did reach out to them all and we still find that some of the emails are going to the people that retired. But I think Virginia Tech is pretty smart because for the director of this department, Leslie O'Brien, anybody, maybe some people might know who she was, um, she, she retired as emeritus, so she would forward the emails, so we got pretty lucky in that uh, aspect. Uh, in regards to inter interlibrary loan, uh, they actually, there was a person right before I started that uh, had an untimely death and there were no plans in place. And she was the borrowing supervisor. So, you know, and you don't always have access to their electronics because it's under their name. So you, you can't, you can only imagine how many hurdles you have to get through. 
to get that data to make sure you're not missing anything. So these are like reasons why I think it's so important to really think about getting and putting some plans in place. Um, and I think, you know, I have some really cool pictures, I think, but uh, you know, it's like reflecting, you know, what's the most important? You know, think about your personnel, uh, if you're a manager, think about who might be retiring soon. Think about, um, you know, are, is somebody not happy? Because if people aren't happy and you can't make them happy, then they're probably gonna leave. So that might be another area that you look at um, to uh, set up a plan. Uh, but the most important thing, I think, start with an outline. You wanna collaborate with the people that you work with. Uh, because you can't know it all, and especially if you're newer to an organization, you don't have the historical knowledge that it takes to really put some of these plans together. That's why it's collaborative. And you should always review and update these because things change over time. And with that, I'll say thank you. Was I on your time? Hey. Okay. <laughs> Um, good afternoon. This presentation looks at one library whose tech services department closed and whose responsibilities were moved to another unit that saw a doubling or tripling of their workload. My approach is to frame this as a breakup, like in a romantic relationship, and you end up separating and going through the emotional stages mm -hmm. of the breakup. So FAU is one of 12 public universities in Florida, located in the southeast region, halfway between West Palm Beach to the north and Fort Lauderdale to the south. We have six campuses with Boca Raton serving as the flagship. With a 30,000 plus student body, FAU is aspiring to become a top 100 R1 institution. And you may be familiar with FAU because the men's basketball team made it to the final four in spring 23. As a library system, we have over three and a half million items among three campus libraries. The Wimberley Library on the Boca campus is where I'm based. Um, Personnel-wise, we have approximately 65 faculty and staff. Our collections budget has been at three million since at least 2008. And we have a number of signature special collections, including the Jaffe Center for Book Arts and the Weiner Spirit of America collection. What I'm going to quickly present to you is what I experienced as the AD and head of collection management through the years, beginning with what I'm calling the blissful years, or at least the years where there weren't many outright issues. For about five years, we had three units, collection development, electronic resources, and technical services. Note the number of staff and librarians for each area, as well as the functional responsibilities for each. After, after the five years, we went through some organizational changes and consolidated the e-resources and collection development units into collection management. And the technical services department still existed. Again, note the number of staff for each area. At the end of 2017, there were staffing needs in other areas of the library, and in order to help them, technical services was closed and staff were moved accordingly. This is what I'm referring to as the breakup the library breaking up with tech services. For collection management, we gained three <coughs> employees, one librarian and two staff. However, we also gained all of the responsibilities of that department. So following the breakup, collection management, in addition to what we were doing before, the negotiations, licensing, collection development, e-resources work, we also added acquisitions and cataloging and many, many headaches. We were now a team of seven doing the work of 21. At the time of our lowest point, we were in a pandemic. Eventually, we were down to five. One librarian to handle all of the acquisitions and stats, one to handle all of the copy cataloging, someone to do collection development and to coordinate liaison work, and one person to handle e-resources. I, myself, uh, worked on negotiations, licensing, the review and approval of renewals, and management of the collections budget. 
um, might be too small, but this slide here is, kind of gives you a visual of how we went from 21 all the way down to five. I want to emphasize again that this idea of us going through a breakup is my point of view, so I'm not assuming that this is what others on the team were experiencing. After tech services closed, I was in denial that this was happening. I had just started to wrap my head around adding the e-resources functions to my team when this took place. The work was piling up and we quickly had to learn new things with very little time for training. We were using tape to fix problems and hold the ship together. I was often delayed in replying to vendors. I tried to find solutions along the way, so I looked at other library org charts to see how their collections responsibilities were divvied up. I reached out to colleagues to see what they were doing and learned more about their workflows. Finally, it was time for me to accept the situation we were in and find a way to make it work for the FAU students and faculty that we serve, my collection management team, and the library organization as a whole. We are undergoing reorganization again, and we're getting additional help that we need. In the past few months, I've added two librarians and one staff member, and a new staff position is in recruitment. Currently, we have three units, discovery and access, cataloging or metadata, acquisitions, and collections data for a total of three librarians and four staff, plus me as the AD. We're not at the pre-breakup numbers, but that's fine. We probably don't need uh, you know, 21 people. The project, this project is a work in progress, but some things I've learned from the breakup. It's OK to feel angry, confused, and depressed. Feel those feelings, and then when you're ready, accept them and start to move forward. There were times when I knew that we wouldn't be able to hire more staff, so instead we had to do things differently and be creative, which, just, which meant making changes and prioritizing our tasks. We had to move from just-in-case to just-in-time work. I think like any given area of a library organization, it's good to review your priorities because things change, and you'll likely have to reprioritize. One last thing I want to mention is vendors, since this is the Charleston Conference. Many that I've worked closely with through the years are very understanding of our situation and always said that we could reach out to them for help when needed. I'm not sure yet how we can get them to help us, but I'm interested in investigating that aspect for sure. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Zoe and I have now spent close to a decade working on various uh, values aligned and mission driven projects in open research and open education. I've had a lot of great experiences and opportunities along the way, but I'm also exhausted. Not just tired, but bone weary. And I'm seeing good people burn out all around me. I've done it a couple of times myself. I hear the same stories and see the same struggles everywhere. They're in this room. The call is coming from inside the house. <laughs> so I'm here today to share an evolving manifesto that is helping me and many of my friends and colleagues to survive. And I hope it offers you some food for thought as well. Whoops, there we go. Uh, so what's the situation? What are we dealing with? We're looking at chronic underfunding, chronic overworking, the deliberate erosion of workers' rights, the cost of living crisis, Decades of wage stagnation, staggering wealth inequality, <laughs> billionaires, there is no ethical way to be a billionaire, and a general atmosphere of late stage capitalism, imperialism, white supremacy, and patriarchy. It's fun stuff. So how do we survive? Together. The only way we can survive is together. We all have a sphere of influence, and it grows and shrinks at different times. It's different in different context contexts. But we all have one, and think there are things we can do within it. So here are a few of the things that, as I say, I've been working on with colleagues. To start, pay people, all people, for anything. Pay staff, pay students, advisors, research participants, cleaners, servers, everyone. Money doesn't solve everything, but it sure does help. There's growing research on universal basic income that proves that just giving people money is actually a very effective way of improving their lives. So give people money, write them into grants, advocate for them within your departments, make sure people get raises, 
and do what you can to get more workers, more money. Think about where money is going that you don't see land in the hands of workers and do what you can to redirect it. And consider that if you can't do something without substantial amounts of unpaid labor, you can consider not doing that thing. Challenge that scarcity mindset where you see it, including within yourself. You can still do good in the world and care about what you do and still deserve to make a comfortable living. Now there's no naivety here. I understand the challenges we're up against. And within that environment, we can still be strategic in getting more people, more money, except billionaires, they have enough. Advocate for people. When you're in a room, make sure that your presence means that others are represented too. Talk to your people about they want and need, about what they want and need, and keep those interests right next to your own. Ask them to do the same for you. Use your power wisely and for good, especially if you're white, cis, straight, pre straight presenting, or anglophone. Throw your weight behind other people's causes because you care about the person, even if you don't care so much about the issue. And this isn't about manipulation or quid pro quo. While you will benefit from advocating for others by being advocated for yourself, if that's your only end, people can tell. Get invested in them and their successes because they are also trying to make the world or the university or the library or the department a better place. Be kind to people. Not nice, kind. Niceness can hide a whole lot of nastiness where kindness, however gruffly delivered, is unmistakable. Kindness can look like giving tough feedback, it can look like giving clear instructions, and it can look like trusting people to figure it out for themselves. It can look like building in contingencies and adaptable structures so that it doesn't all live and die by one person or one team. Kindness also looks like letting people be imperfect and still wanting the best for them. A person doesn't have to be perfect to deserve a raise or to have their ideas heard. You can assume good intentions until proven otherwise. And there's really no surface, but surface level version of kindness. You don't do it because you want people to like you. You do it because it makes the days, the months, the years just that little bit better. And finally, resist. Resist right in the place where you are. Resist the scarcity mindset. Resist the obsession with productivity. Resist all the ways your job threatens to overtake your life. Do less. Resistance in place is about being difficult sometimes, creating rough edges and bursting out of boxes that you're put into, getting up to some good trouble. Find that safe line of safety for you in your context and walk right up to it. Get comfortable with the mess and the contradictions and stop trying to win at a game designed to make you lose. And join a union or start one. They may be imperfect at times, but they're better than none at all. For all this advice, I want to acknowledge that we cannot personal responsibility our way out of systemic problems, especially when the system is not failing, it's working entirely as designed. But that's where collective responsibility comes in. The strategies I've outlined here help to bring us together and together we can identify our common goals and common adversaries and strategize our way through this mess. At the end of the day, all we have is each other. Thank you.